This is the story of a remarkable man, Samuel Franklin Cody, who was an aviation pioneer and the very first person to fly a powered aircraft in Great Britain in 1908. He was born in the American frontier town of Davenport in Iowa in 1867. His early career was that of a cowboy moving cattle across country. At the age of 21, he featured as a showman cowboy in Adam Forpar's American Touring Circus. He certainly looked the part, with Stetson, moustache, beard and long hair, and resembled his hero, Buffalo Bill Cody. Cody was an expert lassoist, horse rider and sharpshooter. He moved to Olympia in London to star in a Wild West burlesque in 1890. For a cowboy with little academic training, he wrote a play called Klondike Nugget, which was a great financial success and represented a new experience for London theatre goers by incorporating Wild West action and stunts into the melodrama. It played to packed houses for five years until 1904, when his attention turned to the challenge of the skies. Gene Roberts, who lives in the house that Cody lived in when he made the first flight, had accumulated a huge archive of, of evidence and, and she was the one who'd done the research. She was the one with the accuracy. Uh, when I moved into the house 30 years ago, the estate agent said Samuel Cody had lived here. Um, I didn't know who Samuel Cody was, so um, I decided to do some research. All the newspaper cuttings, and I've got quite a few, say he was charming, he was funny, he was very kind. He was also flamboyant, which I like. He was theatrical. He remained theatrical all through his flying days. He started off with his man lifting kites, huge kites. How he got this interest, we're not sure, but it must have started in America. Um, but he came over and he started doing theatrical work in theatres, but flying his kites in intervals. So he mixed both careers at the same time. Flying the kites used to give him publicity for the people to come into the theatres. Um, and at some point he dropped the theatre and concentrated on his kites. And the huge kites gradually turned into a motor kite and a glider. And it was eventually when he came to work at Aldershot first and then Farnborough that he started work on his aeroplane. And he went on from there. He developed the basic Hargrave box kite uh, to put wings on it. And he met a man called Baden Powell who was not the scout man, it was his brother, who was an army officer who was trying to develop a kite which would work in a wind to get people into the air for observational purposes to take over from balloons which didn't work in a wind, which is what the army were using at the time. And in 1904, he rather tricked a senior army officer into seeing what he could do, and they immediately took him on as the chief kiting instructor of the British Army. And had also got the Navy interested in kites because of the fact that if you are on board a ship, the ability to go to altitude is a great advantage to enable you to see further. He had trials with the Navy uh, and on one occasion the captain of the ship inadvertently turned the ship around out of the wind. Cody lost lift with his kite and almost drowned. In 1904, Cody was taken on as an instructor in kite flying in the balloon factory in Aldershot. Having moved to Farnborough, they built an airship, and the airship was called Nolly Secundus, and it was ready to fly in October uh, 1907. It flew from Farnborough to London uh, in October 1907. It beat up the House of Parliament, it beat up Buckingham Palace. We have a photograph of it over St Paul's Cathedral. And then the time came to come home and the wind was so strong they couldn't make progress towards Farnborough. So they decided to put it down at Crystal Palace. And there it had to be held by the sappers whilst the crew went home and the wind got stronger and they had to deflate it 
to uh, uh, bring it home by road and train and they invented some improvements to it and called it Nolly Secundus II uh, and unfortunately the improvements were so heavy that Nolly Secundus II would not fly correctly and they abandoned it and that meant there was a large space in which Cody could begin to build a kite big enough to carry him an engine some fuel and hopefully be able to control it in free flight and that's indeed what happened and that aircraft became British Army Airplane number one. On the morning of the 16th of October 1908, Cody's biplane fired up at the third turn of the starter wheel. The aeroplane left the ground after 60 yards and rose to an altitude of 40 feet, clearing trees by a mere 8 feet. Unfortunately, as Cody said, I turned the rudder and turned it rather sharp, resulting in smashing the left wing into the ground. Cody was unharmed and walked away. The power of flight was 440 yards and lasted 27 seconds. Cody became the first aeronaut in the UK to achieve powered flight. To celebrate the centenary of that epic flight, a group of volunteers assembled a non-flying replica of that British Army Aeroplane No. 1, otherwise the Cody Flyer, in 2008. It can be seen today in the Farnborough Air Sciences Trust Museum. The Wright brothers, who flew first in 1903, did not fly in public and show everybody what they could do until July 1908, by which time this aircraft was built, uh, but not flown, and Cody felt obliged to fly what he'd built. And given that they had wing warping on their aeroplane, he made sure his aeroplane too had wing warping. The, 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 the method by which it works is you take the rigidity out of the outer section of the wing and by pulling uh, it, it left and right on the column it warps the tips up and down in an opposite sense so when one goes down the other goes up. The, the, the cooling system was um, a water-cooled engine. It was also built to be capable of driving a motorboat. Uh, it made experimental use of aluminium which made it a relatively lightweight engine for its time. But the water pump circulated water from a tiny header tank high up through the radiators and, and through the engine. We believe that the engine developed about 50 horsepower and that that was developed at 1200 RPM and the propellers themselves went round at 800 RPM uh, and that would be as much as that engine could cope with. So from 8 litres you got only 50 horsepower. I'm, I'm moving the control column from side to side which moves the top rudder and would move the wing warping to control roll. I'm now moving the column backwards and forwards to control pitch up and down, the equivalent of the elevator at the back of a modern aircraft. And now turning the wheel from left to right to control yaw, which is left and right turn, which would be done on a modern aircraft by the rudder pedals. We, we believe that the centre of pressure, that is the lift point generated by the wings, is uh, well behind the centre of gravity on this aeroplane. Uh, that's our British Army aeroplane number one. And therefore, the wing at the front, which is also the control surface for pitch up and down, uh, is also part of the lift mechanism. You're climbing still. Uh, right, you're now those, level. Those down. You're now descending. Those there. Those there. And, and you're at 50 miles an hour, which yeah. is fine. That's sort of right. When you see it touch down, yes. then you can use the steering wheel. Okay. The propellers were contra-rotating, and that was achieved by crossing the belts on the port side. And uh, the belts, we believe, were made of leather. The only gauge on the aeroplane was the, uh, the, the U-tube and sight glass at the back of the fuel tank uh, and that, provided the aircraft was the right way up, would give you some idea of how much fuel there was in the tank. There is no other gauge on the aeroplane. No speed, no oil pressure, no engine revs, no altitude, nothing. Engine belt driven on this side is uh, a, a, a combined oil pump and fuel pump. The, the one cylinder pumps oil on a total loss basis into the front of the engine and it comes out as smoke, there's no oil in the sump. And the other 
uh, one pumps petrol on uh, uh, an untimed basis, in other words, continuously into all eight cylinders all the time. And w when the cylinder fires, it fires against the fuel that's gone in since it last sucked. It is, it's, it's, it's a sort of fuel injection system and the throttle does not exist. The, the, the means of controlling engine speed is to have an on-off switch which shorted the sparks rather than uh, control the fuel. Uh, the, the engine itself is a V8, a 90 degree V8 of 8 litres capacity and the horsepower was about 50. Uh, most of which was lost in the diabolical propellers which were awful. You can see a domestic light switch and that was his engine speed control. It was either on or it was off. If it turned off, it cut the sparks and the engine of course would slow down. If you put it on, you might get the sparks back. But the sparks came from a magneto which Cody called his magnusence. He obviously had bother with it. Cody used some of the parts that he had used, we have called 1A, and he used them in the second version, 1B. And it used the fuselage, it used the engine, it used the radiators, but the wings were entirely new and the method of connecting the uh, controls was quite different. Um, so it was a, quite an advance on uh, the, the first aeroplane and it was ready to be flown at the end of January 1909. Uh, the generals decided that in the light of the fact that the aircraft flew not very steadily uh, in an up and down sense, it, it, it tended to uh, snake a little bit, uh, how can you possibly say anything at 40 miles an hour? Airplanes frighten the horses. The army is not going to waste any more money on developing fixed wing airplanes. It will concentrate entirely on the development of airships. So everyone, uh, including Cody, got the sack. And he was allowed to keep the airframe, he was allowed to borrow the engine, and he was allowed to build a shed on Laffan's Plain, which is about as far inside the current boundary fence as you can get from the factory. Uh, and all his subsequent work was done in that shed at his expense. And the first one he built was number one, and we've called it 1C. Aircraft uh, 1C was called, we think, the cathedral, but it may be pronounced cathedrale, which I understand is a French word meaning squarish. But we think cathedral because it was big. And it had now two four planes and uh, wingtip ailerons. Um, and it, it had the engine now behind the pilot because he was sufficiently confident that he wouldn't crash to not worry about the engine coming forward and hurting him. Uh, and that was the first aircraft that he built at his own expense. Cody then went on to develop number, his number two, which is, he called the flyer, and that I was capable of taking four passengers.
Cody went on to develop aircraft number three. It was a bit smaller than the others. It was used by Cody to give flying lessons, which was one of the ways in which he earned his living. And he entered it in the military trials at Lark Hill in 1912. Unfortunately, three months before the military trials were due to take place, the aircraft was uh, demolished by someone learning to fly and getting it wrong. Cody's number four aeroplane was a monoplane. It was the only monoplane he ever built. And of course, it didn't have a foreplane, it had a tail. And it was entered by Cody with number three in the military trials of 1912. Unfortunately, one month before the military trials, uh, it was demolished by Cody running into a cow on landing on Laffan's plane. And uh, he claimed the cow had committed suicide. The judge didn't agree with him and made him pay 12 pounds to the farmer. He built number five, starting with a large engine that he knew to be available from someone else's accident, and this is the aircraft he built. And he got a little bit of inside knowledge because of his previous work with the army, and the, that knowledge included the, the need for protection for the pilot. And you can see the, the fabric skirt uh, ahead of the pilot, which was the protection that, that was required by the specification. Uh, he entered it in the military trials at Lark Hill, and he won. The last aircraft that Cody built was called the Waterplane, Cody number no. 6. Uh, the picture here of it is floating on the Basingstoke Canal, um, which he was demonstrating the stability of it by standing on the wingtip uh, to demonstrate that it would float and it would float with stability. But he never took off from or landed on water as far as we know. And to, to be able to use it at Farnborough, he put wheels on it and it was subsequently used for all the activities that uh, he undertook. Um, in order to make a living. The Cody 6 formed the basis of the very first air ambulance, capable of carrying two patients, doctor, anaesthetist and nurse. It was featured in the British Medical Journal in August 1913. Cody used his water plane uh, for, among other things, uh, pleasure flights, which is one of the ways in which he earned his living. On the 8th of August, uh, 1913 he was asked at the, quite the last minute to take on a pleasure flight a recent retired Hampshire cricketer called WHB Evans and they went and flew away from the airfield returned to the airfield and on their return to the area of the airfield something on the aeroplane broke eyewitnesses all had a different view of what it was however they all agreed that whatever broke on the aeroplane the aeroplane manoeuvred so violently that the pilot and the passenger fell out at about 300 feet. And that, I'm afraid, was the end of Mr. Cody and, of course, of his passenger. The, the, the funeral started from the house called Valecroft in Ashvale and went all the way along Queen's Avenue. It is said that 100,000 people lined the route, not because anybody in order to do so, but Cody was a very popular guy by the time he was killed. He was a, he was a pilot of the people and they all turned out and he was given the honour of burial in the Army Military Cemetery in Aldershot uh, and uh, the grave has had additions uh, Lela King is in there and, and one of his sons is in there uh, and uh, it's dominated by a large um, marble angel and it's there to be seen to this day. It is only now that people are taking any notice during his lifetime they were not interested, mainly, I think, because he was still this American showman. And I don't think they liked the thought that an American was the first man to fly in England. He did become naturalised, um, but he did this so he could enter competitions as a, a UK subject. Um, but I don't think they liked him all through his life and they would have much preferred A.V. Rowe to have been the first man to fly or Brabazon, anyone other than Cody. But it was Cody. <laughs>